you know, I've been using in this episode a lot of he and Elon and, you know, and kind of attributing a lot of this to him. But, you know, in just our previous published bonus episode, we were giving Elon a lot of shit about Twitter and about Tesla, sorry, and about the robo-taxi. And I think my comments there stand. It seems like a lot of the stuff he's touching right now, at least from my point of view, and Ray, I'm, I'm happy to hear if you disagree. He, he's saying a lot of stupid shit and doing a lot of stupid shit. And a lot of what he's touching these days seems half-baked and half-executed, except for SpaceX. And it, in some ways, it, it seems almost like because he's distracted from SpaceX that, and the rest of the engineering team is able to execute, uh, it feels like uh, things are, that, that's from the outside, it feels like what's happening. But whether it's him or not, that's one area where I don't think anyone can or should take anything away from what he and, and SpaceX have achieved. And um, it's quite breathtaking and will change the economics and the outcomes of the future. I disagree on the, on the robot taxi part. Uh... Mostly, I mean, obviously at the end of the day, and I think this was, I forgot who mentioned this, uh, I think it was in his book or something, but you have to take him as a whole. You can't like take him of the things that he does really well. And then you don't, you have to take just the, 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 the individual as a whole. But I mean, the simple reason for that is if you look at Apple, for example, and after Steve Jobs passed, the single biggest struggle, though Apple like grew tremendously, you know, after, after that. But the biggest reason why they did that is because Steve Jobs had kind of like prepped an insane lineup of products for them to just like build on and, and take over. But after that, they weren't really able to come up with really that significant new products that were brought to the market that are different or innovative. It was just like a play or build up to what, what he had already contributed. So while Elon is alive and at Tesla, I think his biggest contribution is the innovation and the creativity that he can bring to a new product lineup and continuing to add to the product lineup that it's there. And a lot of people spoke about, you know, they wanted to see the UX of like how the RoboTaxi app would look like and how that would integrate with the ecosystem and blah, blah, blah. But everyone can do that. You have many people out there that are qualified. This is something that's been done already out there. But bringing to the market a product that is futuristic and hasn't been seen out there is definitely something that's, that you need an Elon to do while, while he's there. Now, could they have done things differently or better? For sure. I think, you know, because he's the guy that does the entire show and he does it in his own way. So you end up with a lot of gaps here and there. But again, you have to take the guy as he is. You can't take you know, many people want to just take the great things about him and, you know, don't want to see any of the things that come with the personality. That's part of the reason why he does what he does. The way I would describe it is I think at this point, many people are tolerating his bullshit because of some of the useful things he does rather than, you know, wanting to take part of it or take only part of him. It's also unclear to me that his current behavior is part of the process or is him spinning out of control. Are we talking about Tesla or, or the, the politics part? No, I'm, I'm talking, well, I'm, I'm talking about all of it, actually. I'm sort of talking about his product decisions and his behavior on Twitter, his, um, hypocrisy on Twitter about free speech and, but yet, um, amplifying or silencing voices he doesn't like, or threatening to, I'm talking about for my money, the Tesla robo day seemed too little too late and was a lot of hot air without a lot of detail. They seemed woefully unprepared for you know, a lot of detail. And we had a whole episode about that. So we, we won't, we won't rehash that right now, but we, we should continue this debate, Ray, in future episodes as, as more data points point out. But we, if you've missed it, because we're publishing quite a few episodes, one after the other, uh, this week, go back and listen to Jan Ev and I talk about the robo taxi day. I need to check it out. It was pretty, pretty excoriating. It was, it was, uh, not kind to poor Elon on that day. <laughs> but, uh, the one thing I do want to touch on before we move on is there was something subtle that happened that I, I don't think a lot of people caught that I think is a really important observation. As he was, as the rocket was landing, coming back through the atmosphere, there was no or very little interruption in, in signal, in live video feed and telemetry back to the live stream. And that was thanks to, to, um, to Starlink. And I think Starlink is proving to be one of the most powerful pools in Elon's belt and one of the most powerful things that he's actually built within SpaceX, whether it's providing internet access to, you know, disaster areas like in Florida 
or to war-torn areas like in Gaza and now Lebanon and, and Ukraine, or whether it's providing continuous communication to objects traveling to and from space through the atmosphere. This is proving to be a multi-purpose, highly valuable strategic and tactical asset. And I think it is actually one of his sources of hard power. I think it's rocketry and satellite internet. We shouldn't miss that trick, miss that little detail that there was very little to no interruption during, you know, max Q and, and max heat and max plasma buildup. It was, I thought, was actually a, a little mini revelation embedded in a, the larger revelation of catching a massive rocket with, uh, with chopsticks. Yeah, I mean, Starlink is incomparable with anything else that's, uh, that's out there. I haven't had a chance to use it on a plane yet, but others have told me about it. And it's, it's really day and night. The gap between Starlink and all other satellite technologies is, is just so big. It's very difficult for anybody else to catch up. And the pace and scale, which like uh, SpaceX and Starlink have been able to deploy is also, you know, very hard for anyone to catch up to. Again, this goes back to the same thing we were talking about earlier. There's a Falcon 9 that's being launched almost every day. And whenever there's no clients that want to put payload on these rockets, well, they send more satellites. Yes. So whenever this new Falcon 9 is going up to space, there's more satellites being deployed. So they've really formed already the biggest constellation there is. That's what allowed them to scale the technology, which, which no, nobody else was able to do before because nobody owned their own, their own company that can launch these, uh, you know, launch company to launch all these satellites into space, but him. So, yeah, I mean, it's not just that he owns his own launching capability. He's also filling the remnant inventory of the launch capability with his, <laughs> with his satellites. So it's basically subsidized, right? hundred <laughs> percent. It's incredible. Actually, Starlink is meant to subsidize. I think he's talked about this before. Starlink as a whole is meant to subsidize a SpaceX's cost to pursue Mars. Yes. So they want to make all that money from that to be able to have the capital to really invest in Starship and invest in everything else that will get, get them to Mars. Yeah, I think that's true. And, and I think the whole set, you know, business, the old, the whole commercial business of helping NASA and whatever, getting satellites into orbit for other third parties, that's all in a way you could describe it as subsidizing the mission to Mars. Right. But it, it just seems to me like the full power of Starlink is becoming clear to us and maybe is, is somewhat surprising to him in terms of the number of use cases and the political and strategic power it gives him. So it's not just a great business that you can monetize the ability to launch satellites with. It's also a strategic asset. It's also a mechanism to track these rockets up and down into space. And it's also, 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 you know, so I think there's a lot of use cases for that thing beyond just monetizing his, his uplift capacity. Absolutely. I, I think SpaceX as a whole is probably America's most important defense and military asset there is uh, when That's it right. comes to the next, I don't know, 20 to, to 60 years. I've asked ChatGPT here, according to ChatGPT, SpaceX operates 6,100 satellites accounting for nearly half of all active satellites in orbit. Can you imagine? It's crazy. Absolutely crazy. And, and nobody, I mean, even, so, so if, I don't know if you heard about the whole, you know, Boeing thing with the astronauts being stuck oh, of course. In, in space, all of that. But if you look at the details of, of that and the bid, SpaceX was awarded, I think it, their contract was 20% the value. And they did it in 20% of the time, you know, Boeing missed their deadline. It's gotten to a point where it's too obvious, the capabilities and the resources and the knowledge of space, it became too obvious. Who would have thought that, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago that, you know, some, a startup like SpaceX would come around and make a company like Boeing look like they don't know what they're doing. Well, it's, I mean, it's the difference between legacy companies with enormous amounts of technical, cognitive and process debt and the Silicon Valley founder model, right? It's move fast, break things, test things, iterate fast, engineering first principles, meritocracy. This is, I mean, this is Silicon Valley culture on display. And, and Elon, you know, again, you have to give him credit for some of his first principles thinking, 
What I was trying to say earlier though, Ray, is I don't know that present day Elon is operating at a hundred percent. I think he's operating at 40%. I mean, who else is running six uh, mega companies at the same time? But you, ha you have to remember, you have to remember something that's very important. All these industries that he's operating in, all of the industries, almost every single one of them is a heavily political industry, automotive, telecom, aviation, Absolutely. and defense. All of these are known, you know, in, in, in the U.S. to be, and, you know, I think he's, many people have tried to fuck him over in the last, I think know, there's a lot of many years, a lot of politics in it. I think there's a lot of smart people around him in each of these companies that are keeping the lights on. And you mentioned Steve Jobs, you know, departing the earth and leaving them with some amount of momentum. I think Elon has left the planet on some of these companies and in some of these projects and He's given them plenty of direction and plenty of capital and gathered a great team and they're powering forward. Uh, I'm not saying he, he deserves no credit. I'm not saying he's not involved. I'm saying in recent years, he seems to me to be compromised, cognitively compromised and, and far too spread thin. And so I, again, I'm, this is not to take away what he's done in the past, what the, his companies are continuing to do today and what he as a person is capable of doing when operating at a hundred percent, you know, capacity, it just seems like he's going through some mental health issues, uh, and he, and he needs to, he needs to chillax a little. <laughs> All right. Those are our thoughts about SpaceX, about Starship, about Elon Musk, about mental health in the founder community and all of that. But what do you guys think? Has Elon lost his mind? We want to keep having that conversation. We also want to talk about the future of space travel. Most importantly, does this change the game or is it just another incremental step? Join us in the comments below and share your thoughts.